Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our Wednesday morning Life Life Bible study on the life of David. We begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. We begin with our opening worship hymn, Crown Him with Many Crowns. We'll be led by that, uh, this uh, video, and you have uh, music in front of you. Stop it for one second. I'm sorry. There's something I think I, I should do. Otherwise, I'm not sure how the sound will come through. So let's uh, try that again. Crown him with many crowns. Okay, continue on with our worship, reading responsibly at our trip. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, make known his among the peoples, sing to him, sing praises to him, tell him all his wondrous works, glory in his holy name. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his his Remember the wondrous works that he has done. O offspring of Abraham, his servant. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. 
Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call upon his name. We pray. Gracious God, Heavenly Father, look down upon us with your grace and your mercy. Lord Jesus, what a what a what an awesome thing and, and how comforting it is to know that you do rule on high. You who gave your life for us, suffering and dying for all of our sins, is the one that's ruling all of creation, watching over our lives, making sure that while troubles come, they don't crush us. Be with us as we go through troubling times, both in the world outside and in our own lives and in our hearts. Lift us up and grant us comfort and strength. Heavenly Father, we lift up these prayers, these petitions, some of thanksgiving and some of requests for your help. Lord, we're thankful for those people that have traveled recently and returned home, for Greg and Karen. We ask that you would be with Lonnie and Vicki as they travel home this weekend and be with our brother Irv as he travels up here and then heads back to Florida. Lord, we ask that you would uh, be with Marta as she is being checked for cancer. We ask, Lord, because we can ask anything that, that, uh, that she would not have cancer, that the test would turn out in her favor. But uh, grant the doctor's wisdom to reveal what needs to be done in her life. And we ask that uh, whatever it is, she would be completely restored to health. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Be with our brother Tom as he awaits the results of his echocardiogram. May those results be in his favor and keep him in good health. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. prayer. Heavenly Father, I ask that you would continue the healing in my life, physically, emotionally, and spiritually, head to toe. Continue healing Jack. May his appetite increase. Be with Jill as she cares for him. Give her strength of faith and patience. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Be with all those families who are mourning the loss of loved ones. June Meniere's family, Glenda's family as she mourns the passing of her sister, the family of Naomi Jones and the family of Vivian Thacker, and any others that are mourning loss at this time. Grant them comfort and strength comes only from you, that peace which passes all understanding and faith in Christ and his promise of resurrection. Be a presence in their lives as they mourn. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. prayer. Heavenly Father, we ask that you would provide for a good turnout tomorrow for coffee with event. We're a little concerned, Lord, with the uh, coming winter storm, but you know uh, where that'll fall and how bad it'll be. Mitigate it, Lord, if it be your will. Otherwise, protect us and keep us comfortable and safe until it passes. Be with all those snowplow drivers and people who clean not only our parking lot, but also the roads. Keep them safe and allow them to do their jobs. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, uh, seal and protect our troops that are serving overseas, especially those that are serving near the Ukraine. And Lord, we ask that you would descend with your hand of peace. May peace reign in that area and in all other parts of the world. Bring about a de escalation of tensions. Be with our president and his advisors and the, uh, the military leaders that you would grant them wisdom that comes only from you. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Be with our sister Karen. Uh, we ask that you would provide her relief from shoulder pain. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We give you thanks, Lord, for the good attendance we had at the Valentine's Day dinner yesterday or Monday or Sunday. Lord, we pray that the Bible study lifted people up and gave them a, a correct idea of what stewardship means, that it's about growing our relationship with you. It's the reason why we gather here for this Bible study and do that in the lives of all those that heard. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We also give you thanks, Lord, for the increased attendance at worship. We pray that uh, that might continue, that people's hearts would be filled and uh, that the sacrament would be uh, lift them up and grant them continued strength of faith. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Finally, Lord, be with Rob. Bless him on his birthday. Keep him safe and uh, be with faith as she misses him. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. All these things we commend over into your care, trusting in your great love and mercy, and all God's people respond. Amen. Amen. We pray the collective the day. Almighty and everlasting God, Give us an increase of faith, hope, and love, that receiving what you have promised, we may love what you have commanded. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. All right, as we turn to our study guides and as we prepare to read Scripture, we are on day five. 
So we're almost finished with uh, session two. Took a while. I, uh, I don't rush through these things, but if I get to a point where you feel like we're plodding along and you're getting anxious, uh, if you don't feel comfortable saying something in the middle of study, tell me afterwards. I don't want to uh, frustrate anybody and turn them away, but I think that there's good and worthy things here. And, and sometimes the actual questions in the day don't do justice to what we're reading. That'll be the case today. We're going to read through uh, 1 Samuel 18, 6 to 30. Then we're going to go back through and look at it just kind of piece by piece. And then we'll get to the study questions. Uh, there's a lot in here. You can see there's a lot of verses. And, and the questions in the study guide don't do justice. And so without plodding along, that's kind of our plan this morning. So if you have your Bibles in front of you, I will put this reading on the screen. It's 1 Samuel 18, 6 to 30. And, uh, if somebody wants to start, and if you get tired or wear down, you can stop and we'll pass it off to somebody else. As soon as he had finished speaking to Saul, the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David. And Jonathan loved him as his own soul. And Saul took him that day and would not let him return to his father's house. Then Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was on him and gave it to David and his armor and even his sword and his bow and his belt. And David went out and was successful wherever Saul sent him, so that Saul sent him over the men of war. And this was good in the sight of all the people and also in the sight of Saul's servants. As they were coming home, when David returned from striking down the Philistine, the women came out of all the cities of Israel singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tambourines and songs of joy and with musical instruments. And the women sang to one another as they celebrated. Saul has struck down his thousands and David his ten thousands. Saul was very angry, and this saying displeased him. He said, they have ascribed to David ten thousands, and to me they have ascribed thousands. And what more can he have but the kingdom? Saul eyed David from that day on. The next day, a harmful spirit from God rushed upon Saul, and he raved within his house while David was playing the lyre, as he did day by day. Saul had a spear in his hand. And Saul hurled the spear, for he thought, I will pin David to the wall. But David evaded him twice. Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with him, but it departed from Saul. So Saul removed him from his presence and made him a commander of a thousand. And he went out and came in before the people. And David had success in all his undertakings, for the Lord was with him. And when Saul saw that he had great success, he stood in fearful awe of him. But all Israel and Judah loved David, for he went out and came in before them. Stop. Anybody else want to pick up? What verse did you leave off on? Uh, it it uh, ended yeah. verse 16. starts okay. again 17. David marries Michael. Michelle. How do you pronounce that? Michelle works for me. I don't know. It <laughs> could be Michael, but this would be the female version of Michael. This is not and Saul okay. said to David, here is my elder daughter, Merib. I will give her to you for a wife. Only be vigilant for me and fight, and fight the, okay, I can't. Fight the Lord's battles. I got to read from here. <laughs> I can't make it any bigger, Faith. I know. Okay. And Saul said to David, here's my elder daughter, Merib. I will give her to you for a wife. Only be valiant for me and fight the Lord's battles. For Saul thought, let not my hand be against him, but let the hand of the Philistines be against him. And David said to Saul, who am I and who are my relatives, my father's clan in Israel, that I should be son-in-law to the king? But at that time, when Merib, Saul's daughter, should have been given to David, she was given to Adro, the, uh, yeah. Yep, the, the half of Eliza for, for, for a wife. Now, Saul's daughter, Michael, or whoever she is, loved David, 
And they sold, told Saul, and the thing pleased him. Saul thought, let me give her to him, that she may be a snare for him, and that the hand of the Philistines may be against him. Therefore, Saul said to David a second time, you shall now be my son-in-law. And Saul commanded his servants, speak to David in private and say, behold, the king has delight in you and all his servants love you. Now then become the king's son-in-law. And Saul's servants spoke those words in the ears of David. And David said, does it seem to you a little thing to become the king's son-in-law since I am a poor man and have no reputation? And the servants of Saul told him. Thus, and so did David speak. Then Saul said, Thus shall you say to David, The king desires no bride price except a hundred foreskins of the Philistines, <laughs> that he may be avenged of the king's enemies. Now Saul thought to make David fall by the hand of the Philistines. And when his servants told David these words, it pleased David well to be the king's son-in-law before the time had expired. David arose and went along with his men and killed 200 of the Philistines. And David brought their foreskins, which were given in full number to the king, that he might become the king's son-in-law. And Saul gave him his daughter, Michal, for a wife. But when Saul saw and knew that the Lord was with David and that Michal, Saul's daughter, loved him, Saul was even more afraid of David. So Saul was David's enemy continually. Then the commanders of the Philistines came out to battle, and as, they, as often as they came out, David had more success than all the servants of Saul, so that his name was highly esteemed. Going back to that first section, one to five, um, remember what we said about the ark, David's fortunes are rising, and we get to the end of verse five, and we're up here, right? Everything's good. Saul loves him. The people love him. Everybody loves him. And when you get to the top of the hill, where's it going to go? Down here. It's going to go down. You notice the relationship between Jonathan, who was uh, Saul's son, and David. It's pretty tight, isn't it? Mm -hmm. There are uh, people that identify as homosexual Christians who cite this as proof uh, that God allows for a homosexual relationship, saying that uh, Saul or that David and Jonathan had they had a thing going on. But there's no suggestion of that. It's brotherly love. It's an intense love. And those of you that have served in the armed forces realize what that's like. Uh, the kind of love and friendship you can have with somebody who fights alongside you and proves himself to be valiant. And I think that's really where Jonathan came from. He looked and saw what David did with Goliath and his courage and that the Lord was with him and the Lord had been with Jonathan and they became blood brothers. That's where that's at. So now we get to verse six. As they were coming home, when David returned from striking down the Philistine, the women came out of all the cities of Israel singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tambourines, with songs of joy, with musical instruments. So picture this, Saul is walking through the towns of Israel. What would you call this? What kind of an event is going on here? Victory parade. Yes, very good, Norm. It's a victory parade, right? In this day and age, you might roll the tanks and the the commanders would be in a special vehicle. And so who's walking out front? Saul. 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 Six foot something, tall, maybe relatively handsome, wearing his armor. Who's with him or right behind him? David. Well, David's a teenager. Picture the difference here. Is David walking shoulder to shoulder with Saul? No. Three steps behind. Probably. And the women sang to one another, this is verse 7, as they celebrated, Saul has struck down his thousands and David his ten thousands. How's and Saul going to handle that? He was angry. <laughs> How would you handle that? At least a little bit of jealousy there? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. You're the king. He wanted, he wanted all the glory. 
Just, Even if he wasn't responsible for all of it. Of course, he's the king. But you know, so he's the king. You're the manager or the owner of a, of a, of a business. And you have an employee under you that does great things, invent something that's just fantastic, and it's going to uh, make your company excel. How should you feel about that employee? Happy, happy for him. And grateful. Yeah. Maybe let him have his day in the sun. Yes. Because in reality, does that not reflect on you positively? Yeah. No. Except. Why wouldn't it in, in the in the scenario I gave you, and why doesn't it in this Bible uh, action? What's the big problem? You mentioned it once before. Pride. Pride and jealousy. Yes. You can kind of you, so if Saul was a magnanimous man, if he was a, a a godly man, the thing to do would be put David out in front of him, let him have his day. You know, it seems like any war you have, the the person in charge, be it the president or the general or whoever, they're not really up on the front, and, but they're still getting all the credit. Mm -hmm. And so these people were actually giving the credit to who the credit was due. Mm -hmm. And that made him angry because I he wanted to get all the credit. It, and it would be it would be a different song if they were saying. Israel has been victorious and David has, David has been victorious, but they're comparing David to Saul. And that really puts sand in the wound, doesn't it? That really hits it home. And what else is going on in Saul's mind? What does he know about his place as the king? It's not going to last so long. <laughs> no, the Lord has left him. There's another that's been anointed. He may not really know who it is. But here's David. Now the people love him. And so verse 8, Saul was very angry and thus and this saying displeased him. He said, they have ascribed to David ten thousands and to me they have ascribed thousands. And what more can he have but the kingdom? And Saul eyed David from that day on. The next day, a harmful spirit from God rushed upon Saul. And he raved within his house while David was playing the lyre, as he did day by day. Saul had a spear in his hand. And Saul hurled the spear, for he thought, I will pin David to the wall. But David evaded him twice. Well, what does it say about David that Saul had two opportunities to nail him? He's pretty smart. Smart. And the Lord was with him. The Lord did not want David to die. He had plans for him. What does it say about David's character that he came back and played again a second time after that happened? It would be a He was still, I'm still <laughs> faithful. No, what was that, Rob? Still faithful to Saul. Still faithful to his job with Saul. Yeah. He knows Saul's troubled by a, an evil spirit, and he's continuing to minister to Saul. And he comes back again. And we don't know if he came back a third time. Can't remember if we're going to encounter another one as we come along or not. But Saul's not done trying to kill David. Verse 12 Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with him, but had departed from Saul. And how does that explain Saul's whole attitude, including this spear throwing thing? The Lord was with David, not with Saul. He's besieged by an evil spirit. You don't know if he's making correct decisions or not, but uh, either way, his heart is not with the Lord. It's He's fully his own man, and without the Lord, there our hearts are selfish and sinful. And we definitely don't want to see anybody else take our glory, and he's protecting his kingdom. He, for some reasons, thinks that uh, he can stop what's going to happen, right? That he can somehow prevent what the Lord has said would happen, that he's going to lose his kingdom. I think he's pretty enraged and then of course you, the angrier you get the less you think things through logically good point um part of our training in uh marriage counseling and, and couples is uh you get to a point when you're arguing that you cannot logically argue anymore it's called flooding and it, it involves a, a physical aspect your your blood pressure rises 
and there's things and, and, and endorphins or uh, things are released in your brain and the logic part of your brain shuts down and the anger takes over. And what we're taught is at that point, you want to say to your spouse, I'm sorry, I'm flooded, I need a moment. And flooded is a code word. I'm not saying we're not going to talk about this anymore. I just can't. I need a break. And you go and find your happy place, wherever that is, and you let your blood pressure come down, and you let the logic portion of your brain reassert control, then maybe you can continue on. When you're enraged, you're not thinking right. You can't. I think that David's response is a good message for us, too. If he hadn't been filled with the spirit, I think his response to his peers would have been, this is a crazy guy. we got to get rid of him. He's not fit to look at. He's trying to kill people. You know, I could see a person not filled with the spirit of the Lord going down a different path to what Saul's doing to him and possibly getting a lot of support from his peers saying, yeah, Saul's crazy. Do we want him to be, quote, president of our country, king of our country if he's crazy? we got to get him out of there. But it doesn't show David taking that direction to me. David's, David is a warrior. I mean, he's brave, right? Yeah. Could have took a knife out the second time Saul threw that uh, that spear and in the end of the wall. In defense. But he didn't do that. And as we're going to find out, it's because Saul is the anointed king of Israel. And David firmly believes it's not his place to take that away. That's the Lord. Good. Wait, wait, wait. Question. Oh, no, can't wait. No, no, no. <laughs> so, you know, Saul, Saul is saying, you know, he's, um, he understands that the Lord has departed from him, but it sounds like he still believes in the Lord, but the Lord's departed from him and he knows he's got a bad spirit. How does he know all this? Um, Saul knows that there's a God, that there's a Lord. But I would say Saul's point of view is he's not my Lord. Kind of like the devil. So it's all, it's all a matter of fear. And we're not talking reverential fear and respect, but just plain fear. God is a vengeful God for Saul. The one to be feared. The one that's after his place in the kingdom. But he doesn't uh, understand or believe that the Lord has the power to remove him. In some way, shape, or form, he thinks he can change things on his own, that he can protect his own kingdom. He can prevent from what's going to happen from happening. By his own will and might. Which would kind of say that uh, perhaps the God of uh, Saul is himself. Does that help? Yeah. Yeah. Now we're we're told this is a third third person thing. We're told why Saul was like this that he has this problem with this evil spirit. Did Saul know that he had an evil spirit? I don't know. But we're being kind of being told by the narrator, the writer, and First Samuel, this is what's going on. It could be just he, you know, he thought he was in the right. This guy's trying to take my kingdom. I got to stop it. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay, cool. Thanks for stopping me. Please do that anytime when I get rolling. Or especially when, the, when this is on the screen, Jill, I can't see you guys. So, so on verse 13. So Saul removed him, being David, from his presence and made him a commander of a thousand. And he went out and came in before the people. Going out, coming in before the people, you see him march out to battle and return home. And David had success in all his undertakings, for the Lord was with him. And when Saul saw that he had great success, he stood in fearful awe of him. But all Israel and Judah loved David, for he went out and came in before them. So what was Saul's ulterior motive? What was behind him making David a military commander? I think he's, uh, he's going to have him killed. Yeah. He's, he's out of his presence. He's away from the palace. And 
put him in a line of fire. Yep. Casually yeah. award. Maybe he'll get up, take a hit. And uh, what was what happened instead of that? He was, he was yeah, successful. David was successful. And how did Saul react to that? It made him even angrier. Fearful awe. Uh, he's afraid. He's afraid of what David is becoming and what he's not. But there's awe there. And that kind of adds to the fear. Can you understand how both of those emotions would play off? Yep. Perhaps I can't get rid of this guy. And the thing, too, that David's a young person, not experienced in wartime things, and, and um, he's being successful. I mean, to send him out for that. And every time he goes no out, <laughs> every time he goes out and fights, what happens to his experience level? It's better. It increases. <laughs> yeah. How bad did this plan of Saul backfire? <laughs> All Israel and Judah loved David. He just kept putting David higher and higher on a pedestal to the people. Little side note here in verse 16. Notice we have Israel and Judah, which some Bible scholars think this shows that this was written after uh, the kingdom split into the northern and southern kingdom, uh, after the reign of Solomon, because that's when the designation of Judah and Israel. Judah was a southern kingdom. Israel was a northern kingdom. I don't know that for sure. But they aren't separate right now. They're all, they're all one. But when David does take the throne, you're going to see that little bit of division is there initially. And then they all come together as one people. So at this point, then you'd say like Judah would be like a state and Israel was like the United States. Yep. Tribes, right? yep. So they are united, but maybe not that closely. Yeah. The, uh, the, 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 uh, I don't know. The, the capital is not Jerusalem yet, because David's the one that takes Jerusalem. Uh, it's still occupied by uh, foreigners. So I'm not sure. Uh, I think we do find out somewhere in here where it is. Gibeon or someplace like that is where, where it is. And I don't know if that's in Judah. But you especially get to the time when the capital is in Jerusalem. That's Judah. And so they're kind of like, it's like kind of like making Washington, D.C. a state. And you're afraid that they're going to have too much power because that's where the capital is. There might be a little bit of that tension going on, even in David's time between the whole. So uh, verse 17. Then Saul says to David, here is my eldest daughter, Merah. I will give her to you for a wife. Only be valiant for me and fight the Lord's battles. For Saul thought, let not my hand be against him, but let the hand of the Philistines be against him. What is Saul saying here? Hope he gets killed. And by whose hand? By somebody else's other than him. Yeah. yeah, David's popular, right? If he was to just throw a spear and pin him against the wall, how's that going to affect Saul's popularity there on out with the people? They love David. <laughs> yeah. 18. And uh, David said to Saul, Who am I? And who are my relatives, my father's clans in Israel, that I should be a son in law to the king? But at that time, when Merab, Saul's daughter, should have been given to David, she was given to Adriel the Mehathalite for a wife. And this goes back, we'll, we'll look at this again, but why do you think uh, uh, Saul reneged on the promise of his oldest daughter? He didn't, he didn't really want David as a son-in-law. If David becomes a son-in-law, he's next to the monarch. He, yeah, he becomes close to the ascendancy to the kingdom. Yeah, he marries into the family. Now, uh, verse 20, Saul's daughter, Michal, loved David. And they told Saul, and the thing pleased him. Saul thought, let me give her to him that she may be a snare for him and the hand of the Philistines may be against him. Therefore, Saul said to David a second time, you shall now be my son-in-law. And Saul commanded his servants, speak to David in private. Say, behold, the king has delight in you and all his servants love you. Now then become the king's son-in-law. And Saul's servants spoke these words in David's ears. And David said, does it not seem a little thing to become the king's son-in-law since I am a poor man and have no reputation? 
And Saul's servants, uh, the servants of Saul told him, thus and so did David speak. Uh, is, is David just outright saying he doesn't want to marry her? No. no. What's the attitude of David here? Humbleness. Humbleness. Uh, oh, yeah. That's the forefront. I'm, of a no, I'm nobody. Why would he? How can I do that? Then Saul said, Thus you should say to David, the king desires no bride price except a hundred foreskins of the Philistines. <laughs> so Saul kinds of names it. What might have been uh, David's reluctance? Bride price. In those days, if you're going to marry a girl, you had to pay a certain amount of dowry to the parents, the bride price, to, uh, because they're losing her. And if, if they were a well-to-do family, the price might be higher. If she wasn't a well -to -do, from a well-to-do family, the price would be lower. And this is the, you know, this is royalty. This is the number one family. And so David is saying, I can't pay. Now, the foreskins, the Philistines, that I may be avenged of, of the king's enemies. Now, Saul thought to make David fall by the hand of the Philistines. So let's think about this a little bit. <laughs> the foreskin. What did we learn earlier about the Philistines and Israel? Israel is the... Israel is... No, nope, Israel is the... They're circumcised. They're circumcised. They're part of God's covenant. And the sign of that covenant, the outward side, is they're circumcised. The Philistines... Are not, are not. uncircumcised. So we have that. Uh, the foreskins of the Philistines identifies them as the outside the covenant of God. They're not supposed to be there. They're some of the people that God said, you need to clear out from the land because it's all yours. All right, if you're going to get the foreskin of your enemy, uh, what are you going to have to do to get that from us? Kill them. I was going to say, they're not going to stand in line. <laughs> <laughs> So it is, it is kind of, it's evidence that you've killed them, but that what, why it's the foreskin is going back to that covenant relationship. You've proved that you've killed these people that are outside the covenant. How did you know they were Philistines? Foreskin? Um, they probably look different. Um, different color, shade or something? Um, they might have been. Um, I mean, it could have been anybody's foreskin for as far as I know. Well, yeah, well, I don't know. I don't know about that. Uh, thank you. But the people, they, they, weren't, they weren't of the same background, ethnic background, as the Israelites were. Uh, the Israelites came from Babylon area. Um, that's where Abraham came from. Uh, they were Semitic. And uh, there were some other people in Canaan that were Semitic, but most of those other tribes were, uh, that were in Canaan were different people. They had different culture. They probably looked different. And uh, it's, it's been said that the Philistines came from Crete or somewhere else in the in the Mediterranean Sea area. So they'd be more fair? They look different. You, it seems like a lot of them are big. Um, oh, yeah. If you remember back when, uh, uh, back from uh, Mount Sinai, when God told uh, the people to take the promised land, they sent the spies, and that was one of their comments, is that there's huge people there. Some of those might have been the Philistines. And once again, Saul's putting David in a very risky situation with probably the hope that he's going to get killed doing it. Yeah. Yeah. And it just yep. seems to backfire on him every time. Yeah. It's kind of like wily e. coyote. <laughs> yeah. And when his, this is verse uh, 26, and when his servants told David these words, it pleased David well to be the king's son-in-law. Before the time expired, David arose and went along with his men and killed how many? 200. 200. What was required? 100. He does twice as many. Uh, David brought their foreskins, which had been given, uh, which were given in full number to the king, that he might become the king's son-in-law. And Saul gave him his daughter, Michelle or Michael, for a wife. So David's willing to do this. Uh, we're not told here, but how do, what do you how do you think David thought about Michael or Michelle or whatever her name is? She, she definitely loved him, and he more than likely loved her. He was willing to do that for her. He also thought it was a good idea now to be in the in the in King Saul's family. Maybe he was thinking that. How would you feel? 
you you you've got you've got some dude named like what well, King Saul's acting like that. You have the opportunity to marry into his family. Now you're in his family. Now you're going to be in his presence more. Would you have any trepidation against that? Yeah, real skeptical. I wouldn't like holiday dinner. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but he could have had the other. He could have went the other way too. David might have thought, well, you know, maybe this will maybe cool down some of this tension with Saul and him. Now that I'm his son-in-law and I have his daughter to speak for me, maybe, yeah. And maybe Saul's using that old adage of uh, keep your friends close, but keep your enemies <laughs> closer. closer. Yeah. Okay, now he's in my house. I keep an eye on But that worked for David too, though. Could be, yeah. yeah now I can really keep an eye on the old boy. <laughs> Verse 28, but when Saul saw and knew that the Lord was with David and that Michal or Michelle, Saul's daughter, loved him, Saul was even more afraid of David. So Saul was David's enemy continually. He was, Saul was probably worried that his wife was going to side with David. So. Now he's, once again, yeah. now he really is in the royal family. Now he really is close to the throne. Saul's daughter loves him. Who else loves David? People. 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 Jonathan. Jonathan, his son. Good point, Joe. Good catch. Probably the military part of that, too. Yeah. He's a commander. He's popular with the troops. Let's look back at, at 1 Samuel 18, verse 2. Saul took him that day and would not let him return to his father's house. This is after he killed Goliath, before all the jealousy of the grade and stuff. How was Saul's relationship with David then? Great. Great. Sorry, David, you can't return back to your father. I need you here. I need you with me. You're a key guy. And uh, where are we at now in verse 29? He's got to get down. Get really really stuck any way he can. Saul was David's enemy Number continually. One. It's not going to change. It's going to be that way till the better, bitter end. Verse 30, then the princes of the Philistines came out to battle, and as often as they came out, David had more success than all of the servants of Saul, so his name was highly esteemed. How has David's relationship with Israel changed as a nation? They, they almost worshipped him because he was so successful. Growing and growing and growing. And we know what the end result is going to be. Who's going to, who's going to be the king after Saul? David. What's the hand of the Lord doing here? Getting the people behind them to the yeah. they'll follow. Them. Yeah. Very good. All right, now let's turn to our study guide and, and uh, look at some of the questions that we have there. For question 16, what evidence from the text can you cite to show that David has become a national hero? Well, when they were doing the parade at the very beginning of this, they, they were talking about how he'd done 10, he'd done thousands. In the, room. <laughs> the praise of the people? Yeah, the praise of the people. What about verse 5? Somebody read verse 5. And David went out and was successful wherever Saul sent him. So that Saul sent, sent him over the men of war. And this was good in the sight of all the people and also in the sight of Saul's servants. So he's been set in charge. He's given responsibility and he runs with it. And Saul's happy with him and soldiers are happy with him and the people are happy with him. Everybody's happy with him. but Saul at the end. Read uh, verse 14. And David had success in all his undertakings, for the Lord was with him. So you would call him what? He is the hero. Hero, the golden boy, right? He's uh, got the Midas touch. Everything he touches turns to gold. Everything he does is successful. And then verse 16. 
And all Israel and Judah loved David, for he went out and came in before them. Mm -hmm. And verse 27. Actually, I think we want uh, verse 28 or verse 30 is a better one. The Philistines' commanders continued to go in battle, to battle, and as often as they did, David met them with more success than the rest of Saul's officers, and his name became well known. So, not only among Israel, but who else knows of David and his name? Everyone, including. Listings. Norma? Listings. Because the enemy, the enemy knows who's who knows who he is. To the point where, oh no, that's David coming with the troops. Oh no, crap, hold it, man. It's 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 a totally different thing when your enemies are fearful of you and, and, and they're and you're known among them, isn't it? Definitely the national hero. Okay, we'll look at question uh, 17. What drove Saul in his persecution of David? David's success. Jealousy, hatred. Mm -hmm. Fear. Mm -hmm. Fear. Plus, what does Saul learn? What does Saul know? What, what did Samuel tell him way back when? That David was going to become king. Didn't tell him David. No, Samuel never told him it was David. But what did he tell Saul about his kingship? That it was limited. Because the Lord wasn't with him. The Lord has given up on him, and he's going to choose another. So Saul's got to be constantly on the lookout. If he can remember that, he's constantly on the lookout for who this other might be. He doesn't know it's David. Not yet. He probably suspects it, though. Wouldn't you? I would. Yeah. So there's jealousy, natural jealousy just of anybody. There's anger and there's this fear. This could be the guy. And then everything he does to try to get rid of David Back backfires. Fires. Not only that, as one of you mentioned before, who's who's going over to David's side? Not just the people. The people definitely are. But the who? Army. The army. And who else? Even closer to uh, Saul. His son. family. The king's king servants in the house. The king's servants, his son, and his daughter. Think about where Saul is, seeing all of this going on. Feels like he's left on an island by himself. <laughs> Yeah, everything is slipping away from him, isn't it? His kingdom seems to be slipping away. Question 18, challenge question. Read what Jesus taught about the source of jealousy in Mark 7, 20 to 23. So why don't we turn there in our Bibles. Mark 7. We can actually read 14 to 23. Mark 7, 14 to 23. And he called the people to him again and said to them, Hear me, all of you, and understand. There is nothing outside a person that by going into him can defy him. But defy. Defy. defy him. But the things that come out of a person of what defiles him. It defiles him. Yeah. Defiles. So this is this is directly addressing what the Jews believe. You had to keep kosher. There's certain things you couldn't eat because if you ate them, you became unclean. And they believed it was such a fact that pork, there's something in pork which, which turns you evil, makes you bad. It's a bad oh. food. Okay. Problem with that is who created pigs? 
God. God. Did he create them good in the beginning? Everything was good. Are animals in themselves sinful like human beings? No. Everything is a good gift from God. What makes things sinful like alcohol and marijuana and uh, abuse? We, by how we use it. I mean, you can see with marijuana, hemp, there's some good uses for hemp, isn't there? Even medicinal marijuana is good, right, salutary in certain diseases. It's good for increasing appetite and, and relief of pain. But what makes it bad? It's against the law. <laughs> we, we make it bad because we use it in ways that we shouldn't. It becomes a god. We worship it and we look to it to relieve our pain and suffering to escape reality. Alcohol. Alcohol is evil, right? No, well, it's just no. the overindulgence of alcohol. Because Jesus, well, he drank grape juice. He couldn't have drank wine. <laughs> he created a whole bunch of grape juice in Cana, right? Yeah. And there, you know there are denominations that would say alcohol is evil. Alcohol is a gift from the Lord. Jesus drank it. Probably a lot of the time drank it watered down, but in Cana, it wasn't watered down. So the problem is alcohol is not evil. It's the problem is people make it evil. We make it evil. We overindulge. It becomes our God. Alcohol maybe the water wasn't as good as that. They did mix it. Yeah, the water was bad, so we mixed it with, with the water to make it taste better. But it, you can see there was times of celebration when you drank wine to celebrate. At the way of Canaan, they even said, wow, they gave us the good stuff later. Yeah. So he made the best. It wasn't watered down. Yeah, so this, this attacks that. Jesus is saying, let's take pork in particular, but there are other things they weren't supposed to eat. It's not the pork. That doesn't make you eat it. Nothing going inside can defile you and make you unclean, especially in a religious sense, in a Jewish sense. What makes them defiled? What makes them unclean in God's sight? The things that come out of you. And he leaves it there, and he goes and enters a house. Somebody, uh, who did I have read it? I forgot. Uh, Ron, go ahead and finish it up, 17 to 23. And when he had entered the house and left the people, the disciples asked him about the parable, and he said to them, Then are you also without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from outside cannot defile him, since it enters not his heart but his stomach and is expelled? Thus he is declared all the foods clean. So how does Jesus further explain this idea that pork itself is not bad? It doesn't go to your heart. It goes in your body, body and it comes out. Comes your out. body processes it. It takes all the good nutrients from it. Comes out. And you crap it out. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. So uh, before we go on here, why, why do you think it was that God told them there were certain foods they couldn't eat? If eating it if the food itself was not evil, keep, and keep in mind where they were going and who they were, who was going to surround them in the promised land. Who was going to be surrounding them in the promised land? Unbelieving, Unbelieving nations mm -hmm. who had their own uh, things they ate, the things they did. They worshipped false gods. They worshipped them with temple prostitution and sacrifice of their children, just God awful things. And so how does, what does God want them not to do when they come into the promised land? To set, set themselves apart from everyone around them. Yeah. People would look at them and say, they're different. Yeah. And one of the ways they were different is in their diet. They need the same things as everybody else did. You don't eat the same things, you're probably not going to go to an unbeliever's house for dinner because you can't, right? If the Canaanites are having pork for dinner, you can't go over there for dinner, which is good because you don't want to go over there because you start drinking and you start talking. And uh, maybe after dinner, they're going to go up to the temple and, and uh, engage in prostitution to worship Molech. And, okay, that sounds good. I'll go along. Or they will say, 
oh, they're just like we are. Yeah. And on the other side of the point, too. So they will, God wants them to say, those are different people than we are. There's a difference. And by doing that, if they're being faithful to God, how does that other nations pointing to them and saying they're different, how does that glorify God? They're different in a good way, right? If they would have been obedient to God, the rains would have came regularly, and they would have been established in the land, and they would have grown plentiful, and their crops would have been good. And everything would have been wonderful, and no nations would have attacked them. And they would have been a witness to all those other nations. Hey, maybe their God really is God, and our God is not. But of course, they didn't live that out. But that was one of the reasons why, for all the kosher laws, and why God wanted to keep them separate so they could be a witness to the other nations. Because it was all about if you're a nation and you're successful because of your God. It was all assigned to your God. And now that Jesus has come, we have here, thus he declared all foods clean. Is there a reason now that the Israelites or the Jews need to be separate from anybody else? Is that still, should that still be in effect? Things have changed. Jesus has come to call all people. And while the Jews in the past have not been successful of being that set apart holy people, they've been a set apart people, but actually their witness has not been holy, it's been the opposite. So now is the time to do away with kosher. This would have been a big thing for the Jews back then. This would have been a big thing. Okay, so uh, round 20 to 23. And he said, what comes out of a person is what defiles him. For, for from within, out of the heart of man comes evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sexuality, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. And all these evil things come from within, and they defile a person. Pride. Envy, foolishness, jealousy. Where does it come from? Within. Within where? Heart. From your heart. heart issue. And what is that issue with the heart? What's the problem? Sin. You don't have the Holy Spirit. Sin is there. In what round? You don't have the Holy Spirit. Sin is there. God is not. If those things are controlling your life. Well, you can still be a Christian and struggle with these things, right? Yes. Yes, you can. You're saint sinners at the same time. But the more these kind of things control your life, what's the problem? You think more of that. More of that than you do your God. Who's on the throne of your heart? The devil. Devil? You? Not the Lord. You're pulling the Lord off that throne of your heart and you're saying, what I want is what's important right now. And I'm jealous of Rob. And I'm going to let him know about it. Even though I probably shouldn't, I can't help it. Maybe after I put him in his place a little bit, then okay, I'll, I'll let you rule again, Jesus. But for right now, and we do that, don't we? We do that sometimes knowingly. Knowing that the attitude that we have in our heart is wrong knowing that the words we're about to say are wrong, knowing that the attitude behind those words, oh, Ron, you look so really handsome today. You look like such a young man, and you're so very helpful. I said good words, didn't I? <laughs> Just like the lions, Ron, rebuilding since 1958. That's you. No. Yeah, and, and those are all, that's all heart issue, aren't they? And, and we can act like we're being buddy, buddy, and pal, pal, but uh, heart would declare differently. So Saul's problem was a heart issue, right? The Lord wasn't ruling there. Sometimes it was maybe a, 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 an evil spirit. Sometimes it was just Saul's spirit that was evil. 
So uh, going back to question 18. Second part of that is, uh, how would you advise someone tempted and troubled by jealous thoughts? Pray. Pray. Mm -hmm. Study God's word. Yep. Yep. Was that wrong? Ask for forgiveness. Yes. Repent. Realize the thoughts and feelings you have in your heart are wrong. And then confess them to. God and ask forgiveness from I need to go to confess my wrong hearted attitude and what I said to him. And then what do I need to say to him? You're sorry. And forgiveness. Will you forgive me? Those are hard things. That's what needs to happen. If the transgression is bad enough and we've hurt somebody, that really needs to happen. What do we tend to do instead? Shy away from it. I'm just not going to mention it. Maybe Ron will forget that I said those things. Maybe he didn't even notice that I said them. You ever had somebody say some nasty things to you and then just act like nothing happened? Mm -hmm. Is it easy for you to forgive them? Yeah. Especially if they don't ask for forgiveness, if they don't acknowledge to you. They find it harder to forget. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. It a second time. Excellent. It would it happen a second time? Yes. Something we said about corporate confession, too. You mentioned that another Bible study is where when you're talking to someone, God forgive us for our sins because too often the world sees us as Christians as doing what? Tom, shame on you. <laughs> Repent, Tom. We're in corporate confession. We say, wow, we're sinners. Yeah. We sin every day. Every day. Yeah. Tom, you and I need to repent yeah, together. Exactly. exactly. I need to repent and you need to repent. Exactly. We all need to yeah. ask for him. But the world doesn't always see Christians as being that way. Well, we're not we're not like that to the world yeah when we when we do something to somebody in the world that's wrong what do we need to do yes and change behavior yes yeah, that, that that's the follow-up isn't it that's living out your repentance is change because repentance means turn i want to turn from the direction i'm going and what i'm doing and i want to go in a different direction i want to go in that god's direction so it's more than just words. It's to change how I now act with you. Does the world do that? No. When somebody does something wrong in the world, what words are said, if anything? It's not my fault. That? Or do you hear I'm sorry? No. Sometimes. I'm sorry, but. I'm sorry, but. Ron just wouldn't shut his mouth. How am I supposed to? <coughs> Is that repentance? No. If, if there's anything after I'm sorry, if there's any but, chances are there's not repentance. There's not true repentance. You're not really sorry. Now you're spinning, and now you're making excuses, and politicians do that all the time. <laughs> Push comes to shove, they'll get the I'm sorry in there, but there's always a yeah. justification. In, in negotiations, I know you've done a lot of that. Negotiations, I would never expect you to say, we got everything we wanted. And that's the difference, too, with Christianity and other things. When you're forgiven, you're forgiven. But in the world, it's, you know, the government gave us this much, but it's not enough. <laughs> we didn't get everything we wanted. And that's the difference between the world. The world doesn't get everything they wanted. We get from Jesus complete forgiveness. complete forgiveness. We can't say, but there's more. On a rare occasion, you do see people that go all the way, that admit they're wrong, 
and they ask forgiveness. And in this day and age and in this political climate, what happens to them? It's the Holy Spirit. Well, they lose their seat in the Senate. They're canceled. <laughs> <laughs> They're canceled. You, that's the cancel culture. And that's the unfortunate thing. If you're going to go far enough and take full ownership of what you've done wrong, they're going to attack you and cancel you. See, he admits he was wrong. He needs to lose his job. Nobody listened to him. Let's cancel his Twitter account. Let's vilify him. Even things that happened 20 years ago. Chrissy and I, Chrissy probably knows this is going on. There's a, uh, there's some people, the Loop Clinic. You familiar with the Loop Clinic? that's going on in uh, at Franklin Avenue Mission. Mm -hmm. it, it's a group that's coming in to provide uh, uh, medical support for pregnant women. There's a group out there because they have a doctor from U of M who in the past has been associated or is not, she's, it's questionable whether she's a Christian. And it's questionable, uh, U of M is, is not exactly right to life, okay? So it's been said because they're using this U of M doctor that, that Franklin Avenue Mission and Loop Clinic uh, supports abortion because we're using this doctor from U of M. And they've, and they've actually accused her wrongly or without... Uh, it was a nurse. A nurse. And she worked for... Uh, she was from U of M, but she worked for... What's the place that we... Planned Parenthood. Yeah. She since she has resigned. Okay, so in the past, she worked for Planned Parenthood. And so this, this, this group, which is actually Right to Life of Michigan or Right to Life of Genesee County, is claiming that uh, Loop Clinic is, is pro-abortion because this lady is, is poor using her services. Because that lady can't change, right? At one time, she might have worked for Right to Life. She can't change, right? If that mentality was true, Paul would have never known it. Just think Paul well, would have never made it. No, none of well, us would ever say, look it. at him. He hasn't changed his, or he can't believe him. He can't believe him. So what was, what was the best thing about Paul? He would put himself on the line. He would say, I am the chief of sinners. Exactly. He never, he said, I'm the one that held the robes while Stephen was being yeah, stoned. Yeah, I'm the biggest of and what, why was that such a successful witness? Because it shows anyone can change. Exactly. God forgives and all. This person is in the same boat. And, and, the, and the strength of the change, right? The the change How total that change is. Exactly. What a great witness for the gospel. Exactly. If Christ could do that for Paul. That's the spin. And that's the sad part. Is, is this person that's attacking claims to be a born again, born again Christian. And, and cannot seem to understand that if this lady was involved 100% with Planned Parenthood at the time, that she can't change. And, and it doesn't mean that just because she worked there that she supported abortions. But notice she no longer does. And she is totally in agreement with our right to life stance now. And it's sad, but that's the cancel culture. Though. God forbid people dug up some of the things in my past life um, if the cancel culture got a hold of that, they would tell you, I can't be a pastor. I was a sinner. I was a poor, miserable sinner. I enjoyed being a poor, miserable sinner at one time. But perhaps maybe there's the strength of how the gospel has changed me. By the same token, if indeed you couldn't sit where you're at, I couldn't sit where I'm at. We have to, we have to take ownership for everything. Yeah, and that I think, I think that's where the struggle. Is. There was something that that was said about. I lost that thought that I had earlier, when when, you said the thing about Saul. He would say that there's a God. But it's not my God. A God to be feared. A God, a God to stand against. God and we from. see that among our unchristian friends. Yes. Oh, yeah. I believe that there's a God, but I don't, I don't believe in your God, Tom. Yeah. 
that's funny. I believe in my God, and my God loves everybody. My God would never send anybody to hell. He knows I do some things wrong, but he sweeps it under the carpet. It's okay. Everybody does some things wrong. He gives me credit for the things I do, my church attendance, my good works. That's a great God to have, isn't it? Well, we make that God to be in our image. Yeah. We make him to be ours. We oh, internalize yeah. him. Well, yeah. my God's like me. Yeah. And we add in, and this is big in the culture now, you added some things that you like. Reincarnation sounds cool. So I'll pour that into the mix. Uh -huh. Even even though the, the, the fact book on the one and only God puts that down, well, in my mind it works. Well, that's my God. Al, you can have your God. You don't want to believe in reincarnation, that's fine. But my God, it's okay. My God says that Allah and Buddha, and they're all great ways to go. It's all one big happy God. We're all going to wind up in the same happy place. And that's a wonderful thing to have today because nobody's going to be mad at you. So, Pastor, I was listening to the radio while I was driving, and there was a message that came across called situational faith. Oh. And oh. I just listened to it for a while in the car. And it was amazing how he says exactly what we're discussing. As a personal situation changes, that their faith would change. And so, and it was like an employment thing. Well, I don't believe in the lying, the stealing, the corruption, but everybody around them's fine with it. So I guess I'll be fine with it. They keep working there. And all of a sudden we're okay with that situation. So as situations change in our life, or cultural things change in our life, our faith changes. It, and it, it was a very interesting, you know, presentation he was given. I don't even know where it was on the radio. It just came to me while I was driving. And I found that that's very true. And you see that. I've seen it with family members. Mm -hmm. As things change in their life, all of a sudden their faith has changed. Society has gone from... Uh vilifying those that would kill a baby and saying it's okay. And so now major church bodies have said it's okay. Times have changed. Yes. Yeah. Times have changed. And, and evolved. The yeah. thing that gets you is the people on TV, the media, the personnel, the actors, all of those people, not every one of them, but the majority of them that are out there, they've changed their faith. So it's, yeah, it's that situation. It's just what you're talking about. You know, it's like, um, if you ever watch The View and they'll get on abortion and Sonny is like, well, I'm Catholic, so I don't believe in abortion, but I believe in love. And it's like, you cannot believe in certain things. If you're against abortion, if you're Catholic and still think it's okay to have a president that believes it's okay. It's, it's just not. The Catholic Church doesn't even want them. Okay, let's not go there. But let's, I mean, yeah. that's what's happening in this world. Let's, let's move back to the witness. So it, it, sure, you might be canceled to some extent if you actually say, I'm wrong. I'm sorry, please forgive me. But still, how does that stand out as a witness to the world? You're not going to hear it anywhere else. All of the other major religions, you earn your way to heaven. Christianity is the only one where God did it for you. And right along with that, me asking for forgiveness, I can do that because Christ has totally forgiven me. And there's your gospel witness in black and white, plain as day. And just let the Holy Spirit run with that. Even if the person is still angry with you and sees that confession of yours and that asking for forgiveness is a door to continue to attack you, it's out there. Let the Holy Spirit run with it. There was a lady at Hillard's uh, that worked for me, and I was wrong, and I asked her forgiveness, and she just attacked me in front of everybody. And I was angry enough, I wanted to slap her. And I just, it was uh, a day or so later, she came back and wanted to hear more about my God and forgiveness. I'll tell you, if it was up to me, I would have verbally slapped her or something. The anger level was rising. I was being flooded. <laughs> One of the reasons I shut up is because I couldn't logically comment anymore <laughs> other than a few choice four-letter words that wanted to come out. But yeah, the Holy Spirit's amazing in that way. You know, we're called to uh, 
swallow our pride sometimes. All right. Anywho, there's some ideas on how you could advise somebody tempted and troubled by jealous thoughts. They need to confess them. First to the Lord, and then if it's apropos to whoever, whatever person that they've hurt. And it's not an easy thing. Okay, back to our study guide. Uh, challenge question. Oh, no. Uh, yeah. Um, that was uh, 18. All right, so we're on 19. Saul offers his daughters in marriage to David. Obsessively, he was fulfilling the promise uh, to reward the person who killed Goliath. So for that, let's turn back to see that again uh, in uh, chapter 17, 1 Samuel 17, 23 to 25. Somebody want to read verses 23 to 25? I think we're still in 18. No, we'll return it back to 17 for these three verses to, to connect on that promise that uh, was made by Saul. 23 to 25? Yeah, As he talked with them, behold, the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, came up out of the ranks of the Philistines and spoke the same words as before. And David heard him. All the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were much afraid. And the men of Israel said, have you seen this man who has come up? Surely he has come up to defy Israel. And the king will enrich the man who kills him with great riches and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. Those three promises, right? Riches, won't have to pay taxes, and that guy automatically becomes part of uh, the royal family. And uh, you know, back then, when you married, um, you, you, you first the first girl, the first the oldest daughter would be the one that gets married first, and that would probably get you closer to the throne. The oldest daughter, and then the pecking order would be the next one down understand as, as ascendancy to the to the throne. Good. So back to our study guide. What ulterior motives do you see in this offer of his uh, in, of, uh, his daughters in verse 17 and verse 21? So verse 17, who's who is uh, saw offering? The eldest daughter. The eldest daughter, I think his name was Mara, right? Yes. She's first. And that's in keeping with his promise. David was the one that killed Goliath, so he should get married. Does he get her? No. Why? He's already married. He married well, her off to someone else. Married off to somebody else. Doesn't say who. We do. We do have the dude's name, but we don't know. He's just Sam, Joe, or some guy from right off the street. So how would how does how was that how would how would you perceive that if you were David? You know that your king is reneging on his word. Yep. And a slap in the face. It is. <laughs> a slap in the face. Especially when David went through valiantly and it was such a great victory. And then who does he offer again? 21? Mikhail. Mikhail. Well, Christ. So the first one, why why did Saul why did Saul deny the first one? Why would he have married off that first daughter? Because he really didn't want David to become part of his family. Because so he was envious and jealous of him because his, of his success. Because his line of succession. Yeah. As the first daughter, would that be it would make him yeah. more in the line of succession? Yeah. Uh, but wouldn't his firstborn son be the one that normally would take it? Yeah. Well, what could happen to Jonathan? He could die. Okay. So he's not going to let David marry into the family because he's afraid of him. But things change with that second daughter with Mikhail. And what's Saul's change of thinking there? Why does he why does he now want to allow David to marry? Because Mikhail loves David. I don't think like Saul's really know, concerned about the love of his daughter. Because right. he keep, he, keep a better eye on it. Because he came up with a new idea and he thought, mm, yeah, if I ask for a hundred foreskins, she's he's yeah. definitely gonna get killed trying to get I those. Think, I think too, too 
He lost out on the first one. It didn't work. It backfired on him because everybody still, if, if he was racing up in the ranks, he said, so plan B is let's give the, the second daughter. I will look good in the light of the people because I brought him into the family. Yep. So now but it, he was looking at a knee situation that now he'll be looked at favorably because, you know, he had a second bite at the apple. Right, because there's there was a couple buffers in there. Yeah. And David may not guess. He wasn't going down the arch very quickly. <laughs> it, it, it's often kind of like saying, well, I'm not really trying to kill him. Uh -uh. Look, I let him marry into my family. Yeah. Yeah. He's a great guy. Yeah. Love him. Love him. Really, really love him. <laughs> yeah, and that 100, 100, 100 Philistine foreskins, mm -hmm. uh, as we have said, they're not going to stand there and let you cut them off. <laughs> Line, uh, and, and when you when you're doing it, all, all of the rest of the army's got to be cleared out of their dead because it takes a little bit of time to do that. <laughs> so uh, the chances of David being killed are greatly pretty good. But remember, he doesn't just bring back a hundred, right? Yeah. Which how does that got to hit Saul? Holy crap! Rub the little salt in the room. <laughs> The fear, the anger, and everything now is 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 up. Uh, David's reaction. How does David react to, to uh, the offers of both of these women? Somebody read verse 18, 1 Samuel 18, 18. And David said to Saul, Who am I? And what is my family or my father's clan in Israel that I should become the king's son-in-law? So what is, uh, what's David's reaction there? He's How do you explain a, it? He's, he's humble. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, I, I don't have any money. Who am I? I'm just a, just a regular warrior. I'm just a Not even that. I'm a shepherd boy. Yeah. A shepherd boy. Mm -hmm. So that's a pretty honest answer, isn't it? You're going to marry the king's daughter. That's royalty. And then how does he answer in uh, verse 23? And Saul's servant spoke to, spoke those words in the ears of David, and David said, Does it seem to you a little thing to become the king's son-in-law since I am poor, a poor man and have no reputation? Poor man might have been right, but what about the reputation? Oh, no, he's got a yeah, wonderful yeah. reputation. So he's being humble. And we don't know this, but let's see. Saul is, uh, Saul's tried to pin him to the wall twice. <laughs> Wouldn't let him marry the first daughter. Do you think there's anything going on in the back of David's mind? I'd be thinking that those foreskins it may not even work out when I get all those to him. Could possibly. That's what I'd be thinking. Could, could there, would, would David have any reason to have some trepidation of marrying into Saul's family? I would. I would. Uh, you'd be What's thinking next? now, what? That, right. You know, what do I have to do now? Sleep with one eye open. <laughs> 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 many eyes. Who should sleep on? Sleep with like, one eye open. Yeah. David. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but you, you know, if David David seems to be truly humble, which tells you even amongst his success, has he become full of himself yet? No. no. And and truly. Uh, is that right? I mean, he had success, but uh, who who should, where should the honor, glory, and the reputation go? To David? No, to no, God. God. To God. Right. Awesome thing, isn't it? How hard is that when we have success in our life? How easy is it for us to accept the responsibility for it and not give glory where it really When it's interesting when they say uh, when David says that he's a poor man and has no reputation, he has good represent or reputation for the people because of his accomplish, accomplishments on the battlefield. But when I think about him saying reputation, I'm thinking about each of us have a reputation of some sort, and it's how we've perceived. 
uh, it's got more to do with us as a person, not so much our accomplishment. What kind of a person are you? Who are you? Who are you? And that's what he's saying. He's not trying to blow himself up because he could say, well, I'm a poor man, but I've done all of these things. He, he, well, not bragging on himself. Even when you're in the midst of loss, and perhaps that loss has come outside of you, it's not your responsibility, but even when you've screwed up, you've screwed up. Who are you? In the midst of your depression and your admittance that you've screwed up and you're a poor, miserable sinner, yet who are you? God's child Christ. of God. You are a baptized child of God whom he loves. And that's always how we should self-identify ourselves. Even when we screw up, even when we're confessing our sin, however miserable it may be, I am still a baptized child of God. That's who I really am. That's your reputation. And if he loves me, even if the world hates me, if he loves me, is that enough? Yes. yes. That's enough. Even in the most miserable times of your life, your life is worth something. It was worth Christ going and dying for it, right? Yeah. Your life is worth tons. Let's see if we can get this last question in here. Question 20. You may not be a prophet, king, shepherd, or military leader, yet you too belong to God by faith for obedience and service. God's grace and power are readily available to you. Even though you may feel unworthy and insignificant, how is it possible for you to live confidently and righteously before God, despite the failings and the fears you sometimes experience? Remembering who you are, remembering whose you are, remember what Christ done for you. Even in the midst of your fear and your failings, may they be from outside you or even you're responsible for them, how does God still feel about you? Still love you. Still love you. I think as you get further on in the study of David, you see how much he screwed up and you think, man, he, and he was still God's favorite. Yeah. He was still God's chosen. Yeah. God never gave up on him, did yeah. he? And he, I mean, he really, I mean, he did so. <laughs> God never gave up on him, and did David ever give up on God? No. No. He, he would go, oh, man, I screwed up. He retained his faith. Faith was always there. Even, even in Bathsheba, when he had kind of set God aside and was ruling in his own heart, um, repentance took hold, didn't it? He turned and returned. There was, that was the point where he was really in the, the pits of despair. Oh, yeah. yeah. The realization of his sin was just so great. And at that point, I mean, there's you're kind of at a crossroads, right? You can just give it up. Well, I've screwed up so far, God can't forgive me now. But that isn't what happened when he was confronted with it by a sin by David or by Nathan. When Nathan said, you're the man. You're the one that killed that man's poor little you sheep. You. And at that point, he could have taken this. Well, I guess I can't be forgiven. I might as well eat, drink, and be merry. But instead, I am a poor, miserable sinner. And he received the grace and mercy of God. Had to suffer. There were temporal consequences. What happened to that baby he conceived with Bathsheba? Died. Died. Broken. It was a miserable thing. But yet again, and you know, we'll get to that. He's mourning while the baby is still alive. And, and that's a sign of his pouring out his heart to God. Please don't, don't judge this child because of me. Um, restore it to health. But when it's too late and that child dies, David stops his mourning and returns. He accepts what the Lord has done. Maybe even realizing that since God is a gracious God, where's the soul of that child? With God. Any final comments or questions before we break? And then...
Any comments from Zoom land at home? No. Pastor, oh, you haven't said anything. Well, I'm sorry I was late. I had a dentist appointment at nine o'clock, so oh. that's why I didn't come in until 10.30. No problem. Better no. late than never. I had to get up so early this morning. Maybe that's why I'm quiet. I had to get up <laughs> at six o'clock. <laughs> we're going we're gonna to pray, and uh, then uh, I'm going to stop the recording, and Reverend and I are going to talk for a moment. You guys can listen in. Uh, and then next week, we do have uh, the, the ma enrichment magazine that's in with your information. Uh, we're going to read through a section of that before we move on to uh, uh, session three. It'll be pages eight to 13 if you want to look at it. Those are recommended to read uh, during, as we finish up this section. All right, so we'll do that next time. Uh, let's close with prayer. Gracious God, Heavenly Father, throughout David's life, he always knew whose he was, that he was your beloved child. May we, as we go through our life and we have things to repent of and ask forgiveness, be they things that we've chosen to do that stand against your will or when we screw up and forget about what, how we're supposed to act and when we forget to do the things that we're supposed to, whatever the sin may be, Lord, as we repent and ask forgiveness, help us to remember who we are, your baptized child, and who we belong to, and that's you, a gracious and merciful God. Help us always to remember how Jesus showed that love on the cross and in the empty tomb, and how the Holy Spirit continues to pour that love, grace, mercy, and faith into our lives. Gather us up together again this evening as we uh, continue our Bible study, and then this Sunday as we worship together as God's family. All these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.